Hello, my name's Julianne Edgar, and I'm the author of a whole lot of books on car modifying. I've written on car aerodynamics, I've written on modifying car electronics, and I've also written this book called Optimising Car Performance Modifications. How you can actually find out if your modifications are going in the right direction, or conversely, they're a complete waste of time. What I want to talk about in today's video are intercoolers in road cars, and I'm stressing road cars, not race cars. How do intercoolers actually work? Now you might be saying, I don't need to know that. I already know how intercoolers work. The turbo or supercharger compresses the air, that makes it hot. The air that then goes through the intercooler, which cools it down, less chance of detonation, can run more timing advance, more performance. What else is there to know? Well, if you really want to know how an intercooler works on a road car, the first step is to fit an intake air temperature gauge that reads out on the dash what the intake air temperature is in real time. So you need a fast response probe and you need a fast update display, say three times a second. You fit this to your car, you drive your car in all sorts of normal conditions just as you would normally on the road and you watch what the intake air temperature actually is. It's a huge surprise. Most people don't actually realize when highest intake air temperatures occur. If you live in a hot country, you will find the highest intake air temperatures occur when you're stuck in traffic idling. You can watch the temperature go up and up and up and up, and that's got significant implications. If you're sitting there at a set of traffic lights for a long time, and then you cane the car off the line, well, all that hot air is going straight into the engine. More chance of detonation, uh, more likely that the timing will be pulled back by the engine management system. So watching the actual intake air temperature is a really, really good way of starting to see how an intercooler actually works, or when you're stuck in traffic, how it doesn't actually work. It's not really achieving anything in that situation. But what about on boost? After all, that's why the intercooler's there, to, to, to cool down that boosted air. Well, when you drive the car hard, when you drive the car on boost, even if it's a car with a, fa a fairly small engine, you'll find that you actually use boost events relatively little. In other words, what proportion of the time when you are driving on the road are you on full boost? If you said 20%, I think it'd probably be too high. Even a diesel, which is on boost a lot more than a petrol engine typically, a gasoline engine, isn't on boost all the time or even half the time. It's on boost for short terms, when you're accelerating away from traffic lights, when you're overtaking another car, uh, when you're climbing a hill, things of that sort. So the first thing is we have episodes of boost, short-term episodes of boost. Now, during those boost events, there's heat being generated in the intake air and that is passing through the intercooler. Some of that heat is being dumped into the intercooler, which is storing it. Some of that heat is being dissipated immediately by airflow through the intercooler. We're talking here about an air-air intercooler. So what proportion of the heat is being dissipated real time as you're on boost, and what proportion of the heat is being stored in the intercooler to be got rid of over the next few minutes or next few moments when you're not on boost? Well, you don't actually have to have a figure that describes that relationship. All you're gonna do is think in your head, some of this heat when I'm on boost is being stored in the intercooler for later dissipation. Now, the first time I saw that, I couldn't believe it. I had a high performance car, uh, a very big hill I used to climb in, in third or fourth gear, going pretty fast, 100 miles an hour, 160 kilometers an hour, on boost all the way up the hill. And I'd watch the intake air temperature because I expected that the highest intake air temperature would occur when I was on boost climbing the hill. But it never did. What happened is I'd get to the top of the hill, I'd back right off, and then I'd watch the intake air temperature rise, and I couldn't believe it. What was happening is the stored heat, the heat that had been stored in the intercooler core, was then being fed back into the intake air going into the engine, and because there wasn't a lot of intake air going into the engine, I, the, the throttle was largely closed, uh, that, that small amount of air was being heated quite a lot by the heat that had been stored in the intercooler. So you actually saw highest intake air temperatures after you'd reached the crest of the hill and that heat was being fed back into the intake air. That was fine. Um, when I was on boost up the hill, the heat was A, being dissipated by the intercooler, B, being stored by the intercooler, and so the intake air temperature was never particularly high. 
Now you can start to see if you've got two mechanisms occurring, real-time dissipation of the heat and real-time storage of the heat that then is later shed both to the atmosphere and to the air that's going into the engine, you've suddenly got different mechanisms at work. So for example, a really lightweight air-air intercooler core has not got much capacity to absorb heat. Okay? That the heat has to be got rid of real time. So if you have a lightweight core, it really has to be huge because it's not going to be able to store the heat. The, the amount of heat that the core can store is largely related to physically how heavy it is. Technically, it's thermal mass. So a lightweight core will not be able to store much heat. It needs to be got rid of real time. It needs to be really, really big. On the other hand, a very heavy core with all the passages connected to the air, of course. Uh, you just can't add a lead weight to the core and call it heavy. That's not what I'm talking about. That will have the ability to store a lot of heat and then get rid of it over a period of time. What are the implications of this? The implications of this is really in real world driving in a road car, not a race car, a road car, when you're on boost for relatively short periods of time, out of the total time, you typically do want a fairly heavy core and you also want one that can get rid of heat real time as well. So heavy and large. But it becomes really interesting when you stop talking just about air-air intercoolers and you start talking about things like water-air intercoolers. Now I've run out of time to describe that in, in this video. I'll do another video that talks more about water-water, uh, sorry, water-air intercoolers. Um, but keep in mind those two ideas. An intercooler is storing heat and it's exchanging heat real time during your boost event. And both of those things will have a huge impact on the actual intake air temperature that is occurring on the car on the road. Thank you.